Hello and welcome to One Tribe, One Day. We have a really fantastic panel today on China, US-China relations, William and Mary's work in China. It really is going to be a, <clears throat> a fantastic discussion. One Tribe, One Day is a really important day for William and Mary. It's a day that we give back and pay it forward for everything this institution has done for us. This is a really important day too, because we are still in a pandemic. And the way that we're reaching out now through virtual means such as this uh, has actually opened up some doors as well as making things difficult. In the international sphere, we are now able to do William and Mary events that immediately have a global audience and we think a global impact. We are doing virtual study abroad. We are reaching out to our international students online. We are doing global engagement and global research around the world through distance technology. And uh, all of that has been made possible partly because of your generosity in supporting the international initiatives through your gifts. So we wanna make sure that you are generous today and helping us reach our targets. Last year, we had over 7,000 donors on One Tribe One Day and contributed over $2.5 million to William & Mary on the single day. And this year, we wanna break through that record and get to our target. We want 13,150 donors. It's a big, ambitious goal. But since we are, in fact, celebrating One Tribe One Day on a global scale, starting early this morning in Tokyo and extending around the world, we think that we can, we can do it with your help. Uh, this is a chance for you, too, to support international initiatives at William & Mary in a variety of ways. You will see in the box below you a set of links that have just been helpfully shared. And you can support the Global Research Institute. You can support study abroad scholarships. You can support international student scholarships. You can support Chinese studies. All of those are available at the click of a button. And these are all incredibly worthy causes, which really help us do all the things I just mentioned. Support study abroad, language and culture training, international student recruitment and support, and work at the Global Research Institute dealing with China and the entire world. Uh, I'd like to just mention a couple of housekeeping notes before we go to the event itself. First, uh, we'd love you to attend all of the events that are set up today for One Tribe One Day, because there are a number of extremely exciting ones, including two more related to international affairs this evening, one on study abroad then and now, and one on Global Research Institute uh, activities. So please look for those. We also uh, hope you know we are recording this. So uh, if you're uncomfortable with recording, do feel free to leave, but uh, otherwise you'll be recorded. And uh, we also want you to know that the chat box where you see the links are, is also the place to uh, let us know if you have questions for the panelists. I'll be collecting those questions over the course of the event and then asking them at the end uh, so that our panelists can respond to you in the short time we do have with them. So without further ado, let me introduce our panelists themselves. And we're really lucky here because our China panel today includes some of the greatest experts at William & Mary on the subject and from a variety of backgrounds, disciplines, and schools. We have with us Brad Parks, who's also, by the way, William & Mary class of 2003. He is the Aid Data Executive Director at the Global Research Institute. We have Michael Hill, who is the Program Director and Associate Professor in Chinese Studies in Modern Languages and Literatures. We have Professor Deborah Hewitt, who also is William & Mary, class of 75. She's Professor Emerita at the Raymond A. Mason School of Business. And last, but by no means least, we have Professor T.J. Chung, who is the class of 1935 professor, so uh, supported by your philanthropy. And he is my colleague in the Department of Government. We're gonna go in that order. Each panelist is gonna speak for you know, seven to 10 minutes. And let's start off with Brad Parks. Brad, take it away. I'm thrilled to be here uh, this, this afternoon. Thanks for spending a little bit of time with me. I'd like to take the time that I have to um, just throw a spotlight on a really exciting project that um, is underway right now, um, uh, really finds its origins with uh, student research at William & Mary and is having an outsized impact in the policy world. So the project is called uh, How China Lens. Um, and it is a, a collaborative project uh, between Aid Data, a research lab at William & Mary, and uh, three think tanks in Washington, D.C., the Center for Global Development, the Peterson Institute for International Economics, 
and the Kiel Institute for the World Economy in Germany. Um, all, all said, all told, I think there's maybe 130 uh, students and faculty uh, that have been involved in this project over the last three years. The, the main policy report summarizing the findings uh, from the project was just rele released on March 31st. And just in the course of the last two weeks, this report has um, really uh, blown through Western capitals and really uh, captured the attention of uh, senior policymakers in the White House, on the Hill, within the G7. Uh, you know, we had the German finance minister sharing the report with his counterparts um, uh, within the G7. So just a tremendous initial response. So I just want to kind of give you a uh, let you peer inside the report, give you kind of um, uh, the highlights and help you understand a little bit about how um, how the sausage is made, <laughs> so to speak, here, here at William Mary. So um, the, the motivation for the study is the fact that China is now the world's largest official creditor, but we still lack really basic facts about the terms and the conditions of its lending because very few contracts between Chinese lenders and their government borrowers have ever been published or studied. So the purpose of this project was to understand how China lends to other governments around the world. And to do that, we did a, a systematic evaluation of the legal terms of its foreign lending. Um, and we did this um, by assembling the largest source of debt contracts uh, between Chinese government lenders and developing country borrowers um, ever put together. And that happened right here in Williamsburg. So the foundation for the analysis are 100 unredacted loan contracts. So these are the verbatim contracts, not excerpts or summaries of contracts between Chinese state-owned lenders and their overseas borrowers. And we obtained these contracts um, with a huge team of student research assistants at William & Mary scouring the debt information management systems of borrower countries, um, official registers in, in borrower countries, and going to parliamentary websites. Some borrowers have a, the, their parliaments have a role in reviewing and ratifying foreign loan agreements. Um, so once we obtained uh, access to these unredacted loan contracts, then what we did was we systematically evaluated the financial and non-financial characteristics of the contracts. So things like borrowing costs, collateral, guarantees, confidentiality requirements, what constitutes an event of default, um, all of these types of things. Then we also went and identified um, a, a set of benchmark loan contracts from non-Chinese lenders so that we could uh, do an apples to apples comparison between Chinese loan contracts and non-Chinese loan contracts. Those benchmark contracts from 28 non-Chinese lenders, um, they really span bilateral lenders, multilateral lenders, uh, com commercial lenders. So we have 100 Chinese loan contracts, 142 non-Chinese loan contracts. And we use that same set of uh, criteria and variables to code um, both uh, sets of, of contracts. So um, on March 31st, we published all of those contracts um, to aiddata.org. So if you're online right now and you go to aiddata.org, um, you can see the unredacted contracts yourself. We used an investigative journalism tool called Document Cloud to digitize them, so they're searchable. You can search them by lender, by borrower, by sector, or by contract clause. Um, the three main takeaways uh, from the How China Lens study are the following. The first is that we found Chinese contracts contain unusually broad confidentiality clauses that prohibit their borrowers from revealing the terms or even the very existence of the loans. And this really matters for, for two reasons. The first reason is that this is public debt, right? And so if you think about public debt, uh, who's going to repay it? It's the taxpayers in the borrower countries that are bound to repay these loans via taxes, right? So it's not the people signing on the dotted line. It's not the finance minister. It's the taxpayers. And so it's very hard to justify why public debt should not be public, right? And so um, these confidentiality clauses are problematic in that respect, but they're also problematic in a more immediate sense. Um, so as many of you know, because of COVID-19, 
economies have been frozen in place and that has sapped the repayment capacities of uh, borrowers in developing countries. They're having trouble servicing their loans. And so many of them are trying to renegotiate their loans. And this has created a conflict because the non-Chinese uh, lenders are saying, look, we're not gonna renegotiate the terms of your loans until we know uh, what your outstanding debts to China look like. And this is putting borrowers in an impossible position because they're saying, I'd like to tell you what I owe to China and what the terms and conditions of my, my borrowing are, but I'm prohibited because I've signed these ironclad um, confidentiality requirements. So Zambia is a poster child. They're stuck right now. They can't, they're having trouble um, getting private bondholders to reschedule because private bondholders are saying, we wanna know if we're a senior creditor or a junior creditor, and we won't know that until we know more about your Chinese debts. And Zambia is saying, but I can't tell you anything about my Chinese debts because I, I signed these contracts with confidentiality clauses. Second big finding from the study um, has to do with collateral. So we find that there are provisions in these contracts that position Chinese state-owned banks as senior creditors whose loans should be repaid on a priority basis. So. Um, despite what a lot of us see in the media, what we hear is, oh, these Chinese banks are asking for physical sources of collateral like ports or electricity grids that they can seize in the event of default. We do not find that. What we find is that Chinese lenders, they actually prefer what you can think of as uh, liquid assets or grab and go assets. They don't wanna collateralize on a port because if, they, if the borrower goes belly up and can't repay its debts, then you got to go before a judge, perhaps in another jurisdiction, to try to recover those overdue debts. The Chinese lenders are savvier than that. What they do is they ask their borrower countries to maintain very substantial cash balances in offshore bank accounts or escrow accounts that they control. That way they have um, the ability to simply dip into their borrower's accounts to collect unpaid debts. Um, in the event that their, their borrower is um, approaching default or falling into arrears. Then you don't have to go through a judicial process that's costly and time consuming and uncertain. We also find these quite, um, uh, quite astonishing clauses in the contracts um, that we, we refer to as don't even think about clauses. And um, what they do is they tell the borrower, don't even think about rescheduling your debts through the Paris Club. The Paris Club is something that was set up after World War II that basically would bring for a developing country borrower that's in debt to stress, they would literally go to Paris, sit around a table with all of their um, creditors. And the idea was let's reschedule your debts in a coordinated way. So this doesn't de uh, devolve into an every man for himself law of the jungle situation where each creditor tries to get the sweetest deal possible. Instead, we're all gonna do this in an orderly way where there's some comparable treatment across the creditors. So now here comes China. They were not part of that regime and they have um, included clauses in the contracts that say, if you get in over your head and can't repay your debts, don't expect us to show up at the Paris Club. We're gonna go head to head. And by the way, our debts your debts to us are collateralized for a lot of the Western creditors to whom they also owe money. Um, they have not collateralized their debts. Really official creditors stopped collateralizing their debts after the end of the British empire. So that effectively makes China a, a senior creditor. So they're, they're essentially saying, we're a senior creditor, we're at the front of the repayment line. And if you get in over your head, we're the first ones that you need to repay. And we're not gonna go through a multilateral negotiation to figure out how these, um, how these debts get repaid. And then finally, uh, we find that there are clauses, rather unusual clauses in these contracts that really limit the policy options of borrower countries. They include broadly defined cancellation rights and repayment acceleration rights in the event the lender disagrees with the borrower's policies. So for example, if a borrower enacts new regulations or legislation that would negatively affect Chinese commercial interests, the borrower would face the risk of loan cancellation, even if those commercial interests are totally unrelated to the loan. 
So the Chinese like these cross default clauses or cross cancellation clauses that really make it difficult for the borrower to exit a project without risking a cascade of defaults. So I'll give you an example from Argentina. Um, we obtained the verbatim uh, uh, documentation, a letter that was sent from a Chinese lender to the Ministry of Finance in Argentina, um, where there was uh, the first administration, Christina Kirshner administration took out uh, two very large Chinese loans, a $2 billion loan and a $4 billion loan, one for a hydroelectric dam, one for a railroad. When the uh, administration turned over and the McCree administration came in, they looked at these two projects and they said, we like one of them. We like the railroad project. We don't like the hydroelectric dam project on environmental grounds. We want to cancel that project. Well, no sooner had they announced that they intended to cancel the project that they got a letter in the mail. And the letter in the mail said, welcome to power. Read the fine print in your contract. Because if you choose to cancel the hydroelectric dam, you will automatically cancel the railroad project that you, that you would like to keep. And no sooner had they received the letter as they, the McCree administration reversed course and said, never mind, we'll, we'll stick with both projects. So you know, they came to power on a pro-environmental uh, policy platform. They tried to move the government in that direction and China walked them back. Uh, because of the, the presence of these cross cancellation or cross uh, default clauses. So basically the picture that emerges from this report is of China being a very muscular, commercially savvy lender that wants to re be repaid on time and wants to be repaid with interest. And they design contracts accordingly. And since we've released this, um, what we found is that this has really um, prompted a lot of debate and discussion among other creditors and among borrowers, um, because much of this was hidden behind confidentiality clauses. We were able to obtain this subset of 100 contracts. And so this is now uh, really leading to um, a, a sort of rethink about um, how uh, official lending happens, uh, how it's structured to developing countries. So I think I'll, I'll pause there. Thank you so much, Brad. It's just fascinating research and amazing to see William and Mary uh, students and faculty putting this all together, uh, making such a big impact. Michael, um, if you can tell us a bit about your research and work in China and uh, in a very different discipline uh, in the humanities, that would be great. Sure, yeah. I serve as director of a program in Chinese studies and as associate chair of modern languages. And, and I, I think I'm actually just going to start doing one of the things that's most fun about my job, which is bragging about my colleagues because they've been doing so many amazing things over the past year. Um, Su Qian, who is our longest serving faculty member in Chinese studies and a senior lecturer in Chinese, uh, was just elected uh, president of the Chinese Language Teachers Association of Virginia, which is a, an organization that serves K through 12 and college level Chinese teachers throughout uh, the Commonwealth. Um, another great, really interesting piece, um, we, we have several William and Mary representatives on a, a fellowship program sponsored by the Woodrow Wilson program. There's the Wilson China Fellowship, which is a non-residential fellowship. And we have uh, Professor Emily Wilcox is a recipient of that fellowship this year for her work on China's cultural diplomacy in the 1950s and 1960s. And she's joined by two William and Mary alumni who actually took classes with her and worked with her to write their senior theses uh, back in the early 2010s. Uh, Austin Strange, who is an alum also of Aid Data, and then Emily Matson who just finished her PhD at University of Virginia. So in this fellowship program that's extremely competitive, has maybe a dozen recipients, we have three people from William and Mary, uh, or three, three people with connections to William and Mary who are gonna be representing uh, the work that we do there. Uh, Calvin Hui is gonna be coming back to uh, rotate into my role as director of the program in Chinese studies after a, uh, holding a fellowship from the American Council of Learned Societies on copycat culture. So this includes everything from knockoff uh, consumer goods, to uh, copies in architecture and uh, visual arts and other kinds of uh, other kinds of cultural products like that, and then Paul Viertaler, uh, who has recently joined us as an assistant professor at William and Mary, works on pre-modern Chinese cultural studies, but also on the digital humanities. And he recently just opened um, the MLL Lab, the Modern Languages and Literatures Laboratory, which is where students work with him on research projects. 
um, related to uh, computational approaches to the study of language and literary and cultural texts. So those are some of the things that um, our colleagues uh, are working on. And, and I think that you know, it's against that backdrop that we have really seen a major change in the kind of overall environment for teaching and learning about uh, Chinese language and, and Chinese culture and society over the past few years. Of course, the, the COVID pandemic certainly um, uh, has, has upended a lot of relationships, but I was very surprised to see, you know, just recently it was reported that U.S. public opinion on China is actually at its least favorable point since the Gallup organization began taking polling data in 1978. Um, and, and so this is the, the kind of environment that, that we, are, we are working in right now. We've recently seen uh, the suspension of the China Fulbright program uh, that happened just in the past year. Uh, we've also seen the Peace Corps China program has been recently suspended. And so there's, there's real questions about collaboration um, that are out there and that we see in our, in our daily work. And, and these, you know, despite, I would say, some of the complaints or lamentations of my colleagues, it, it genuinely, these policy changes genuinely reflect a change in public opinion and in elite opinion over the past um, five or six years. And they also reflect um, a kind of longer term ideological line that we have seen from the People's Republic of China uh, under, under the current leadership. And of course, this is also a response to actions that are taking place in, in places like Hong Kong and, and Xinjiang. Um, not to mention, I think, just kind of a general turn from the, 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 the optimism that we saw after, say, the 2008 Beijing Olympics. Um, there's, there's a real sense of kind of maybe some disappointment with the result of some of the, the outcomes of, of economic globalization since China's entry into, into the WTO in, in the year 2000. So one of the, what we really talk about at all of our meetings right now is how do we continue to provide pathways for students to study Chinese and Chinese culture and society? And of course, teaching great courses is the, the primary way that we do this. Um, and, but also it's really trying to communicate, and I think particularly in our virtual environment, over communicating with students about the possibilities for different kind of study and career options. Just last night, um, we did a little Zoom, we called it an express Zoom info session. We promised everyone it would take less than 45 minutes and we wound up in 40 minutes. It was for uh, an aid data program. Uh, Kira Solomon and uh, Zhang Sheng, who are both uh, junior program officers, um, talked with students about an internship program. It's for the tracking, Brad, you might have to help me with this, tracking unreported financial flows, TUFF, T-U-F-F. And this is, a, this is a great way for students to use, even if they're at the intermediate level uh, or the advanced level, to use their language skills in doing very meaningful research. Um, so we've, we've been organizing events like this. We recently had a, a, another alumni panel with students who graduated over the past seven or eight years and work at places like Department of State, the consul in Guangzhou. Uh, we had a former representative from the former member of the US Trade Representative Office who now works in a private consulting, another person who works at the Center for Advanced Defense Studies. These are all students who graduated within the last four or five years, really trying to make sure that we can communicate to students that those career paths uh, are, there, are there for them and very meaningful work is there for them as well. Um, we're also looking um, you know, more to, to programs in Taiwan. Uh, there's also a lot of student interest in programs in Taiwan. Uh, we just have, just learned this week, we have a student who just got an English teaching assistantship uh, for Taiwan. That's a wonderful, that, it's called the ETA, English Teaching Assistantship Program, is a wonderful program. And um, we, we are also looking at some other partnerships there, as well as with uh, the, the TECRO, uh, which is Taiwan's sort of de facto uh, embassy in the United States. Um, we are also hoping to restart our Beijing summer program in 2022. We have for many years, for over 30 years, Wayne and Mary has run a summer intensive uh, Chinese language and culture program in Beijing. And um, we, we have a very successful program at, at our partner school, Beijing Normal University. And we're really hoping to, to restart that again. And um, more generally, we're, we're trying to bring more kind of uh, China related courses into the general curriculum. Because I, I think our students really recognize that in the current situation, there's so many aspects of Chinese society and culture that uh, raise very significant intellectual questions. And they really embrace that. Uh, our, our culture classes are usually anywhere from 80 to 110% full. And we are trying to offer more courses that are outside of our major, maybe outside of our minor, but that really offer William & Mary students the opportunity to 
uh, you know, learn about these issues and engage with them in a way that that fits into um, in, into their other into their other interests. Um, I guess if I had one wish for the for the future, it would be that we can restart some of these programs and especially expand programs like uh, the Critical Language of Scholarship. This is one that we we've just gotten a couple of good note good news notifications from students, but it's one that's it's so competitive and it's a relatively small investment. Um, in terms of funding for students, but it really makes a difference in their career. So we're, um, we're, we're, we're hopeful, but we're also very mindful of, uh, of the changing landscape. And with that, I think I'll, I'll wrap up there. Thank you, Michael. I, I have to say that summary really shows what a jewel in the crown of William & Mary, the Chinese Studies Program really is. Uh, the faculty that you have attracted and the leadership you've shown personally, it's really stunning. Uh, it does build on decades of work. Our engagements at Beijing Normal University and with other universities in China are really a strong foundation for this work. Um, that leads us to uh, Deborah Hewitt, who's going to tell us a bit about the Mason School of Business interaction in China. So, Deborah. Great. Uh, thank you so much, Steve, and hello, everyone. It's a pleasure to have this opportunity to share with you what is going on at William and Mary, which you've already heard a lot of exciting pieces. And I guess in the business school, uh, to some extent is, you know, where the rubber really meets the road in terms of dealing with China, because so much of it is business interaction that's uh, bringing on some of these conflicts, cultural as well, of course. Um, you may have seen a uh, editorial in the Wall Street Journal a week or two ago by a China expert saying that basically the summary of the uh, article was, every US company needs a China strategy. And I'm happy to say that about 10 years ago, a group of uh, business school faculty were meeting and discussing our strategies on a number of things. And that was one of the most compelling statements uh, that somebody made, that we as a school and as a business school needed a China strategy and that our students would need a China strategy when they exited here. At that time, so about 10 years ago, uh, you know, China was uh, emerging, had, had emerged to a large extent, but was still in the really emerging phase. But we knew certain things that were immutable and indisputable. They had the largest population in the world. They had the largest stock of reserves. Uh, financial uh, ability, $4 trillion of reserves that they could spend on projects, on whatever they wanted to spend it on, leapfrogging technologies, uh, you know, becoming world-class in whatever area they wanted. They were the fastest growing um, importer and exporter in the world. They were a major component of the supply chain in increasing number of industries. So, you know, you could just go down and, and list reason after reason. And this was about 10 years ago. Since then, of course, it's only uh, increased. Uh, China is now the world's largest exporter by almost a factor of two. The United States is the second largest. Uh, they are not quite the world's largest importer. The United States holds that um, distinction, but they're gaining on us quickly. China's middle class is larger than our entire population. And as you may have also seen recently, China now has, uh, Beijing now has more billionaires than New York City. And the middle class is just coming up behind that wealthy class um, becoming major consuming force in the global economy. So, you know, you need to have a China strategy. If you're in business today and, and I used to say this again, 10 years ago and, and even more so, even if you're running the, the, you don't think you have a global business, say you, you're running the corner laundry, uh, you have to buy chemicals. The price of those chemicals could be driven by Chinese demand. Uh, every industry today has become global and China being such a large player in those markets, um, it's imperative whether you feel we should cooperate uh, with China, whether you feel we just need to be stronger competitors, either one of those strategies means we need to understand what's going on in China. So at the business school, I would say we're really um, uh, just reiterating uh, what Michael just said, that <clears throat> we are committed to teaching our students 
as much as we possibly can about Chinese culture, because that's, that is an essential element of how they deal in politics and in business. It's inseparable. Um, I think much more so even than, than here. We don't recognize the cultural attributes we bring to the table as much, but with China, it's, it's absolutely intrinsic. So we're committed to teaching cultural aspects, of course, the economics and um, business practices and, and, and collaborating in order to give our students the best possible understanding of China, both as a, 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 a corporate entity, meaning China at large, but also individual Chinese companies to give our students the best possible understanding of who they are dealing with on the other side of the table and therefore making their business plans and uh, running their businesses uh, the best way they can. So we, we do that in a number of ways. Um, we have uh, courses that specialize in uh, China and uh, the Chinese economy. We bring in outside experts to speak. We are very fortunate to have another, a number of alums uh, who have had diplomatic or corporate positions, uh, very senior in China. And boy, there's nothing the students love more than um, hearing outside speakers because they have really been uh, on the hot seat you know, in, in these positions that our students may find themselves in. Um, so that's one method. Um, we love bringing in our inside experts, which you can see now we have here on campus. Um, gosh, that aid data stuff is something that nobody else uh, in, in the country or the world could, you know, be teaching locally. Um, Michael, TJ, uh, you know, just bring such, uh, great expertise from their particular dimensions. So uh, we bring in both inside and, and outside experts. And of course, here in the business school, we have um, Chinese uh, professors. And, um, but what we felt was really essential to building uh, our China strategy was to let our students see it for themselves. So I was fortunate enough to have Steve Hansen work with me to uh, take a trip almost 10 years ago, Steve, can you believe it? It takes a long time to set things up in China. You don't just call up and say, we'd like to work with you. Uh, so fortunately, um, Steve was able to arrange a number of high level introductions. And over the course of a couple of years, we did set up a, an excellent partnership uh, with Fudan University, which is one of the top business schools in China. I just want to show you a picture of our, our smiling students there in front of the big Fudan crest. And um, our, the first class that we were able to take there uh, was in 2013. And uh, again, we had prepared them in advance with a number of activities here on campus. As I mentioned, we brought in inside and outside experts uh, studying uh, culture, uh, uh, politics, history, which again is very essential um, in dealing with Chinese people. But when we got there, I'm going to do a little show and tell here, uh, we had another lecture on how to eat um, and not just using chopsticks, which I think you can practice here, but it was how to serve someone who's sitting at your table in China what is culturally correct there, how to have the serving chopsticks and not use your personal chopsticks when you're served, you know, where to sit, how to be polite. So um, again, these cultural uh, pieces mean a great deal. Uh, again, I was fortunate enough to have Steve coach me before I went. Um, I can say that we were treated royally um, the gender thing didn't seem to be a factor there when I was the one in charge of a specific uh, meeting. I was placed uh, right beside the head of the Chinese delegation, uh, a lot of pleasantries, et cetera. Um, but you, you had to know uh, how to approach it. And we had to start with a long soliloquy. What was most impressive to these Chinese delegations was that we were the second oldest um, university in the United States. And we had to be clear to call it university, um, not college. So anyway, just these little things made a big difference. I want to show you one more place that we went because it wasn't all just study at Fudan. Again, we did a lot of culture. Um, this is an ancient water town. 
And uh, again, this town is something like 1500 years old. We think Williamsburg is old. You know, you don't know nothing until you've seen some of these um, ancient places. And finally, we went to the largest steel factory in the world, um, Bow Steel, and we had an excellent tour there. Um, note the smiling student faces. I'm doing this little show and tell because I wanna to try to make a point, which is that there's nothing like going there. Since COVID and since tensions with China, we have had to do virtual visits. And while some learning takes place, if you thought that was a lot of fun, just looking at my little book, you know, that's about what a virtual visit, <laughs> it's a little better than that, of course, but we feel it's really important the Beijing uh, summer program that Michael mentioned where our students actually go. Of course, there's nothing, no better way to learn a language than to be immersed in it. The same thing with business culture and, and uh, general culture, to be immersed, to be surrounded by the people that you wanna be dealing with. I'll just make uh, one more point in um, conclusion. I felt through the entire times, and so I've been going every year for the past 10 with the students, and um, we, we are greeted warmly. The individuals uh, that we work with, um, you know, treat us well. They're happy uh, to be dealing with uh, William and Mary and our programs and our students. Uh, of course, it became a bit tense. There are cameras everywhere and, and the students know that, that you're being recorded and you have to watch, you know, what you have on your phone that uh, we have had some students uh, who were with the security department and, um, had their phones hacked. So, you know, you have to be careful, but that's part of what you learn, isn't it? That's part of what we hope they will learn by going. So um, again, I just want to emphasize that we are doing, continuing on with what we can in the current environment, but we really look forward to being able to go back, uh, re reinitiate our programs that, that have been so successful for so long and, um, get back in person and, and then expand those programs beyond. Because whether you feel we should compete or cooperate, essential to either of those strategies is understanding. And that's what we're aiming for. Thank you so much, Deborah. Uh, I couldn't agree with you more. And you know, person to person contact is really what we're about. I mean, educational environments have the advantage that we can somehow create people to people contact, even in very difficult geopolitical environments. And uh, William and Mary has been a great example of that. And a lot of it, thanks to your work. I do remember the trip 10 years ago with great uh, fondness. Uh, and for everyone listening today, also don't leave your chopsticks sticking up in your rice, just, just so you know. I'm gonna turn it over to, uh, to Professor Chung. And, and I'll mention that uh, TJ and I are old friends from uh, days, days of graduate school. We actually got our PhDs at Berkeley at the same time. So we go back a ways. Thanks, uh, Steve. Uh, as a political economist, I like to uh, focus on the uh, my own projects. I don't direct any programs at all, so uh, probably I would just uh, make a sort of a general point and also sort of uh, showcase uh, sort of some sort of findings that I got uh, thanks to the uh, William Mary support uh, for my research. And the uh, I think it is important to uh, look at China from inside out as well, not from outside in. And also, uh, sort of uh, from outside in, we see China sort of kind of coherent whole there, huge and the centralized government there, dictating here and there uh, with a flying colors uh, result you know, nationwide. But I submit that a case probably can be made, you know, to somehow look at China regionally, uh, uh, sectorally, and also look at probably uh, even cultural differences between different regions there. So uh, uh, the uh, so uh, to find uh, sort of uh, that kind of a nuances and uh, differences is therefore for the uh, the uh, my first uh, the William Mary uh, semester uh, uh, summer programs in Beijing, I and my students went to Tibet and also to Nasi uh, the uh, in Kunming uh, uh, in uh, Yunnan, uh, just to look at you know sort of how some of the uh, the periphery, uh, peripheries of China sort of function and how they see sort of uh, Beijing at the center. And also for my second sort of stint there, uh, my students and I uh, went to the Nanjing and the uh, Shanghai and also Anhui, just to see you know, how so the southerners you know, see the northerners there. 
Uh, so you you know it that kind of kind of a region of flavors there. China is uh, you know acting coherently. Yes, I'm looking from outside, but internally uh, maybe there's some kind of you know sort of differences and so on and so. On. So uh, uh, with that kind of a general point, which is that you know, we got to disaggregate it and go to you know sort of look at China not from top down but from the ground floor up. Let me sort of uh, briefly share some findings of uh, my two two of my uh, research projects. The first uh, projects I want to share with you has to do with the regulatory failure, <laughs> uh, regulatory failures, if you like. Uh, China is a sort of a, a greenhouse uh, sort of emitters, right? Leading one uh, in terms of the total amount. And the coal burning uh, the electric power plants is a major cause for that. And uh, for decades, uh, the central government in Beijing tried to somehow, you know, rent in sort of uh, the uh, coal-fired uh, power plants there. And uh, so as to improve uh, air quality, which is what every Chinese likes to have. And uh, unfortunately, most uh, many power plants there are violating rules, <laughs> uh, bending rules, that sort of things. And uh, so the uh, run sometimes even running some of uh, the uh, power plants, you know, without handing license there. So really, uh, the but the violation actually is not, you know, so unevening, you know, so the uh, 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 display out there. It's uh, it varies from region to region there, and I find uh, three places of particular notorious, and uh, the three most notorious uh, places: uh, Inner Mongolia in the north, uh, the Jiangsu province in the east, and uh, also Henan province in central. Uh, the other units in these uh, three regions there are okay, and uh, no problems uh, in the northwest, and no problem in the south. And not at all in Manchuria. So you see that kind of regional things there. And the question there is why? And you know, it should be, you know, sort of a kind of you know systemic studies, which I did. And I find that, you know, uh, many explanations are not just uh, uh, convincing. Uh, first one, for example, high level of industrialization and hence high demand for electric powers, you know, might be a predictor, but it's not. And then, you know, poor uh, the uh, physical conditions of provincial governments might be, but is not a predictor either. And the sort of uh, uh, career incentives, you know, to have more high, sort of higher GDP so as to be promoted to the central committee and that sort of thing doesn't explain either. So eventually, you know, my study shows that uh, actually it is the innovative sort of provincial leaderships that explore sort of a loopholes they manipulate different units among the humongous uh, bureaucracies in central China, in, in, in central government China. As you know, bureaucracy in China is the largest, uh, you know, sort of most complex organization on earth. Right? So that's just one example, you know, one sort of findings of my research. And let me get to you know, the other one, which I think is also equally interesting, uh, which has to do with the, so, with the social unrest and also its implications for regime stability uh, in China. And that is kind of, you know, things that probably, you know, many people would like to find out, you know, whether China is stable or not, you know, regime is will be there for good or not. Uh, social unrest is, it's everywhere. I mean, despite, you know, government's uh, social control, near total control of the society, incidents of uh, social unrest, you know, have been quite high in frequency. But, and even in so, across regions. And here are sort of a few patterns. Uh, the uh, uh, first, there are more incidents in the coastal area and the periphery, Xinjiang and Tibet, than in other regions. Second, most incidents you know, sort of have been uh, mainly work-related and property rights-related, but episodes of environmental sort of problems-related unrest has been increasing though, and very few politically motivated. Third, uh, farmers, are far less frequently involved in incidents, but once they got in there, it would be violent, more violent than others. So social unrest is you know, it's widespread there. It's unpredictable in terms of outcome, in terms of frequency, in terms of uh, the scale, and so So does it therefore lead to you know, destabilization of the regime? Not at all, not at all, because a uh, regime has a very, you know, well teased out survival strategy, governing strategy there. You know, governing strategy composing of uh, occasional suppression, digitalized social control, legitimations, you know, by performing economic performance, 
and also political cooperation, championing nationalism, and so on. And indeed, the government there is pretty savvy, pretty savvy in coping with the social unrest there. <clears throat> so in very, very savvy, mostly letting some of each episode actually run through its own course without intervening, intervening. And indeed, making good use of a social unrest there uh, so as to beef up, you know, it's a sort of governing scales. Why not, right? Social unrest are let steam out like a sort of safety valve and social unrest also, also identify regional sort of, and local cultures that are either corrupt or non-performing. And also social unrest reveals sort of a kind of area where policy change is needed. So I think they you know, are able to make good use of the sort of social unrest to beef up their governing strategies here. I'll just stop there, thanks. Thank you so much, TJ. I have to say um, the picture of China that emerges even from these brief presentations gives you a sense of the richness of what you can explore at William & Mary with these outstanding faculty members. Uh, I just really wish I had 15 minutes with each of my colleagues to hear the entire lecture because there's so much depth. Uh, I did get one question, and I want to open it up now for others who may want to put a question in, in chat. Uh, the question we did get was from a student who was wondering about how we teach about China without getting into the kind of xenophobia that has emerged, and in particular, anti-Asian sentiment. Um, there have been calls to close the Confucius Institute. Let me just quickly say uh, we are actually closing the Confucius Institute in uh, the end of June. But the good news is we're going to be moving back in a way to our sister university relationship with Beijing Normal University, our relationships with Fudan University, uh, the University of Electronic Science and Technology of China and others. So we'll basically go back to the standard way of interacting uh, with academic institutions and partners that we use really around the world. Uh, um, so that will not change. But the question is, I think, a really good one, and I'd be curious to hear the panelists' reactions. I mean, how do we talk, tell the truth, really investigate these um, important questions of world politics, and at the same time, somehow not uh, feel like we're creating more tensions, you know, or actually exacerbating relationships? Anyone want to start? I'll just point out that, as I said, we are treated very well when we go and uh, students that have gone with some trepidation over the years as, as, as relations became a little tense, some students were tense about going and, uh, you know, whether something might have to be arrested or something like that, but the more personal interactions that they have had uh, through the corporate visits, through the cultural events that we sponsor, um, they come away with multiple Chinese friends. And, and I think that's uh, one way of showing uh, these are people too, they have a different political outlook than we do and we're not, um, we're not condoning uh, some of the actions, but the people are people. Yeah, TJ? Yeah, uh, in my sort of China seminar, I typically start out with some kind of comparisons between the United States and China. And sort of giving students that's, you know, this kind of impression that, you know, it's both are huge countries, but you know, sometimes with a similar problem set, sometimes with you know, sort of similar kinds of, sort of trade offs to make and so on. And you can, of course, you know, compare us, you know, sort of the two countries, you know, in a systematic way, uh, in terms of time, in terms of geography, things of a sort. For example, uh, we discovered that you know, the uh, China really developed you know, from the north to south, while the United States from east, you know, from east to west, for example. And uh, so, and, and, and the United States, you know, has a seven of a time uh, zone and China has one. And therefore that got everybody to thinking why, why, you know? And therefore uh, you, we often walk away from the sessions, you know, with uh, sort of two key words. One is the variations. Uh, international variations, you know, it's actually, you know, as important as a sort of difference between two countries. And second is a trade-off. Uh, all countries face so all kinds of trade-off. For example, if uh, you have to make a choice between uh, curbing sort of inflation or uh, the uh, uh, reducing the unemployment rate, uh, China typically, you know, will go for uh, employment creations, and that sort of inflation rate, you know, sort of run high, although not as high as sort of kind of you know, sort of uh, Tiananmen uh, incident years of rate, and you know, this is different, and uh, and so on. So you know, we sort of kind of kind of put two things, you know, in side by side. And then you would discover that, you know, problems and problem solving and sort of thinking along that line. Thanks. Mm, yeah, very interesting. Uh, Michael, did you want to add something there? I, I just, one, one 
kind of problem that I've been focusing on recently in my teaching is how we talk about debates as they occur internally within China. Uh, because one, I think we, we often uh, see portrayals of, uh, particularly in the media of, of the PRC as being just monolithic, you know, Beijing says X and it happens. And in fact, there's often very uh, extensive internal debate and discussion and, and you know, a great deal of new work has just come into English um, translated into English, and and uh, I, I really try to encourage uh, students to to figure out how to read into those debates because arguments might be presented slightly differently. Uh, there may be a, a way of of uh, countering arguments in ways that that doesn't necessarily follow the rhetoric that we would find in kind of North American uh, public discourse, but that still really is evidence of a very lively uh, public debate. Uh, one, and I'll say very quickly, one example of that is I taught a course on Chinese science fiction this past fall, uh, which includes some of the most interesting things you might see in terms of reflections about environmental questions in China, uh, in terms of thinking about ideas of progress and modernization. These kinds of things come out in, uh, in a cultural form that we often think of as being kind of uh, popular and maybe not having the kind of depth of, of highbrow literature or something like that, but actually is contains some of the most interesting recent um, cultural work that's out there. So that's that's one, one, one approach that we've been taking. Very, very, very interesting. And Brad, I'm gonna ask you, you, I know that you shared your research at Aid Data with Chinese colleagues and there's been a lot of interest there. So that was true of the most recent report as well, right? Yeah, it was. And um, <laughs> I guess to Michael's point and some of the other panelists point, I, I mean, the Chinese government did not speak with one voice. There are different parts of uh, the Chinese government. So we had Ministry of Finance uh, provide a, a, a written letter to us that was quite constructive. We had a public response from a senior official in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs that was not as constructive. <laughs> and I think uh, our general orientation when we're rolling out policy research that um, captures the attention of Chinese government officials is to engage constructively when there's demand um, on their side. So for example, in the fall of 2018, we had released a study that um, demonstrated that Chinese development projects were uniquely vulnerable to domestic political capture in Africa. Uh, a lot of the projects that they were financing were ending up in the hometowns of African presidents and prime ministers because of a really unique vulnerability in the way that the projects actually get sourced and approved. Um, and there was initially a very defensive response kind of from high, higher levels in the government. But once the dust settled, um, we had technocrats in line ministries reaching out to us to say, can you walk us through how um, we can set up an early detection system so that when these white elephant projects get proposed, um, we actually know that they're being proposed. So I spent time, you know, two hours in a conference room showing them how to geo-reference uh, projects so that when proposals are coming in, they can do due diligence, you know, do appropriate due diligence so that they're not fast-tracking projects that are going to end up becoming reputational liabilities for them. So, I mean, it just sort of reinforces the point that it's a big country, it's a big government, lots of moving parts. And, you know, you're not going to get our experiences, you're not going to get a lot of traction with people that sort of have to engage in uh, a lot of political rhetoric and, and um, kind of signaling uh, for domestic purposes. But many times we find that there are people at at uh, slightly lower levels, but people that are also in a position to make a real difference um, that do want to engage and are very interested in, you know, data evidence using the best tools from science and technology and engineering to inform what they're doing. Terrific, Brad. And I think it's, it's such a model of how that kind of research can be done in a way that truly is transparent. Um, uh, time is so short. I'm going to ask just one of the questions that's uh, arisen. But it's such an interesting one. It kind of stems from what we just talked about, which is, um, is there a backlash among lower income Chinese now who feel that all this overseas spending on you know, the Belt and Road Initiative and the like is kind of detracting from Chinese uh, wealth? And I, I wonder if someone may have some evidence on that. Well, I, I do have a little. Oh, go ahead. Oh, go ahead, Deborah. 
the, uh, the massive export focus over the past 20 years has led to major disparities of income levels across regions as TJ was somewhat addressing. Um, the North is now their rust belt and is uh, wages are much lower there. Standard of living in the inland is much lower in terms of health um, uh, care, education than the coast, which has been the major beneficiary. Um, and not that there's so much uh, of a backlash, although TJ would know more about that than I do, but there are major uh, discrepancies in standard of living, in progress that has been created. Um, and so that is one of the focus of the recent um, five-year plan is by the government to try to redress some of those very distinct inequities. Jay, I'm, I'm going to add one question for you because I know you might want to weigh in on the first one, but there was also just a question about Taiwan-China relations and how tense they're getting. So I think I'll throw that in. We only have about two minutes. Oh my goodness. Okay, <laughs> uh, very uh, briefly uh, for the sort of, uh, for, uh, the uh, bridge uh, projects uh, response from the low-income people in China. I think so. Uh, initially, probably something like five, six years ago, heated debate in the cyberspace, and essentially, you know, the message here is that. China was doing imperial overreach out there, but you know it's not facing sort of domestic underreach problems there. We are the poor in Guizhou, you know we need help. How come you are pumping money into Central Asia, Central America, things there, right? Uh, but uh, Chinese government is a quick learner. I believe that uh, it has uh, sort of uh, the passion, sort of uh, the fashions sort of its uh, narratives in such a sort of not very nuanced and astute manners. It's not foreign aid to free countries. It's business for us. It earns us money. It also enhances our security. That silence, you know, some sort of domestic criticism there for its a great uh, sort of projects there. For the second questions about sort of uh, military conflicts uh, across the Taiwan Strait and so on, I actually uh, would say that your know, probability is not as high as you know we have been reading about recently, and you know. Every single decision about Taiwan there has to be approved by this gentleman, Xi, uh, who is a president of the country, right? Uh, she, and uh, this is kind of ironically, uh, removed the term limits, right? I impose on him, right? So he could stay more than 10 years, probably 20 years, 30 years, depending on his health condition. If that is the case, I would argue that this kind of rage, you know, for him you know, to solve this you know, sort of a, so of a crisis here across Taiwan Strait is relatively low. He's not urgent. He's not, you know, he is not going to, you know, make a quick decision on that. He can wait, you know, he can be patient. So I think you know, our readings probably is a little bit misguided, I think. Thank you so much, TJ. That's really interesting. Uh, I did get a, a, not really a question, but just a note uh, to mention that uh, William and Mary has always been really good about reaching out to the community to provide these opportunities to engage uh, on China related issues. And I want to reassure everybody uh, in my role as Vice Provost for International Affairs that will continue. Uh, we are always going to make sure that our alumni and our neighbors and really anybody in the country and the world interested in China relations uh, can tap into the resources that you've heard about today. Uh, we've really only scratched the surface, uh, but it does give you a sense for the expertise, the multidisciplinary approaches that we adopt at William & Mary to this critical topic. And as Deborah said, um, you know, the fact that we must engage China uh, as a university, there is absolutely no way to have a serious university uh, international uh, initiatives that doesn't include China at the center, given the fact that it is the largest country in the world, so complex, so important economically, uh, and uh, so many issues facing the world depend on US-China relations and uh, Chinese policies in a variety of ways. Sadly, that brings us almost to the end of our hour. Uh, I really do regret it because I would like to keep going, uh, but the, I do wanna give the floor before we leave uh, to Kate Barney who is our wonderful advancement representative, and she is going to give you a few more reasons to be generous today on One Tribe One Day. Kate? Thank you, Steve, and thank you to all of our panelists. This was really great, and I hope you all enjoyed the time with them. Um, I did wanna thank you all. To those of you who have donated today, we are at 3,374 donors as of right now. Um, and for those of you that are so inclined, please do visit the link in the chat to support these areas or any other areas that um, you would like to today. 